trees parked in this place and the and the the, the mentor and the role model which i follow was and uh, is dr nirmal and i really you know didn't probably get a chance and opportunity to thank and meet him again in last uh, 10 12 years since this year because i have been outside india for last 11 years but um, i i really admire uh, in the way the way he has built up this institute he has so many fellows and so many pediatricians have worked in this place and uh, it's really a sort of a temple uh, or a, like a, like an institute which has uh, helped a lot of people to flourish their career and uh, i think even as a person he is inspired us so many of us how one can be not only a, a good employer but also a role model a leader and an academician and also learned a lot of tips about private practice and also he probably implanted a dream of uh, you know even having your own setup or even building an institute like this and i really admire you sir for that and uh, with that uh, i would like to start on the topic uh, which is uh, a pediatric conundrum so <clears throat> again so conundrum is can everyone uh, turn the mic Uh, that uh, so do you want to say something <laughs> okay so mohit uh, can we just mute your mic yes yes I mute kar diya sabko please continue okay thank you so pd is a big conundrum you will hear this word and a uh, uh, quite often conundrum basically means a big puzzle uh you know there is so many uh, studies have published on pda and uh, we have moved from very aggressive approach of even ligating the babies to a very conservative approach and the more we learn about pda the more we understand we are still getting confused so so why is that confusion you know and uh, but uh, so in, in this talk uh, you know i will try to focus uh, on addressing this confusion and i'll focus this talk mainly for the fellows and residents and people who are sort of in beginning uh, of uh, learning about echocardiography and how we can you know address this topic of confusion and how can we can make uh, decisions more rationally based on your assessment hemodynamic assessment and also clinical assessment so these are the uh, issues we'll try to address and the questions we'll try to address you know what's a pda why we need to treat when to treat how to treat etc so pda is not a dichotomous entity so it's not that pda is present or absent you know as a first year resident you will say ha huh, pda is present treat pda is not there don't treat you know it's not like that we need to understand if pda is there whether it is a beneficial as we know in many kind of doctor dependent conditions it can be beneficial where it is it is your friend and you don't need to touch such pdas or it could be just a bystander you know your baby is completely clinically fine the doctor is there and it's not changing his physiology it's not affecting his clinical condition at all so then why don't why, why we need to address that drug <laughs> or it could be harmful and that's where the focus of the talk is we need to identify those babies where the doctors can be harmful and it is contributing to the physiological changes and pathological changes in the lungs and even other system, systems and that's the drug which needs to be addressed and treated uh just giving couple of uh, few minutes on physiology we need to understand because pd physiology is different than the cardiovascular physiology in the established newborn or the children and and it is an extension of a fetal physiology so we all know in fetal uh, we all know what happens in the fetal circulation pda plays a very important role by shunting bypassing the lungs because they are not working and uh, the deoxygenated blood coming from the upper part of the body is preferentially directed to the rv comes here and the oxygenated blood from the placenta is preferentially directed across the pfo across the pfo and it comes to the right side right ventricle uh, left ventricle and then the left ventricle as we know uh, supplies the oxygenated blood to the systemic circulation and the remaining blood in the rv is shunted via pda to the descending aorta One second, I'm just trying to get rid of this. Uh, yeah. So basically, uh, so that's why the combined LV and RV outputs meet the descending aorta and supply the lower part of the body. So this is we know what's happening in the fetal physiology. Now, 
when it goes to the extreme preterms, especially less than 28 weeks, these babies are often instilled in the fetal or the transitional physiology. And that's why we need to understand what is the effect of the fetal shunts on their physiology. So they will still have PFO, they'll still have PDA. And that's why the physiological understanding can be a little bit complex. So just giving some uh, understanding about how the physiology works in transition circulation. So your right ventricle, which usually has blood coming from the right atrium, should have mainly the blood returning from the systemic blood flow. However, the left atrium shunts a lot of blood in this direction and that's why there is more blood coming in the right atrium, which is a preload for the eye. So that's why your right ventricle output is actually an effect of systemic blood flow and an atrial shunt. Now on the left side, your left ventricle output is the systemic output. However, it is not directly the same because and then and, and the left ventricle output is mainly determined by your pulmonary blood flow return. Whatever the lung is, uh, blood is returning from the lungs coming to the LA, goes to the LV, that's, you, that's your determinant of the preload for the left ventricle. However, PD is playing the role and it's shunting part of the left ventricle output which goes to the lungs and then it comes back again to the, through the pulmonary veins to the LA. And this over circulation keeps happening when the ductus remains open and that's where the LA keeps enlarging and then eventually LV keeps enlarging. So LVO is effect of pulmonary blood flow and also ductal shunt. And that's why when we try to interpret cardiac outputs, which is itself a separate uh, topic, but when we know RVO, so RV is, right ventricle is actually determinant of the systemic blood flow and the left ventricular output is actually determined, determinant of the pulmonary blood flow. And it's other way around what we normally think, you know, LVO is connected to systemic and RVO to the pulmonary. So this is just uh, some concepts to give. Now, now we need to understand which ducts really we should talk about. So we need to know natural history of the PDA. In term babies, most of the ductus close rapidly. Okay, 56% close in first 12 to 18 hours and 96% they will close by 30 to 40 hours of age. So PDA is not a problem of term population at all, unless there is a ductal dependent circulation. Now, what about preterm? In preterm, we can have two groups, less than 37, we can have a group above 30 weeks and in that group, and above 1500 grams, in that group, usually it closes by day four. Okay, uh, so most of the ductus, almost 98% in this population will close. So again, PDA is not a problem in this population as well. Even if it's present, we don't need to address it. Now going down below 30 weeks and below 1500, the studies have shown, uh, there's one uh, a good observational study which they observed natural history of the PDA 280 infants were observed and 85% of these babies, the ductus was closed before the discharge. Then you start wondering, even if you don't do anything, the ductus is anyway going to close, right? But the medium time of the ductal closure, as you can see, is here and it's inversely proportional to the gestation. So smaller the baby, there's a longer, uh, there's a chance that the ductus will remain open for a longer duration. And this duration uh, for which the shunt and the high volume shunt the baby is exposed to, the lungs are exposed to, that can cause the comorbidity. So it's not only the closure which is important, but also the comorbidity and the, uh, uh, the effects of shunt we need to address. Again, if we go down below 28 weeks, we, we you know, naturally think that you know, all babies should have, you know, more extreme just, uh, babies should have, all of them have PDA, but many studies showing that almost 50% of these babies, the ductus will close spontaneously without treatment. So I'm leading to the understanding that, yes, we think PDA is a problem, but actually speaking, sometimes just watching PDA closely and conservatively might be a way forward. But we, we need to understand and learn and track which PDAs will which go in which direction. And that's where the whole hemodynamic understanding comes in the, row, in the play. Now, is it a problem? Yes, again, uh, there are obviously a lot of observational studies and RCTs suggesting that yes, PDA can be a problem. One of the study by Shab Nuri, uh, where he, he uh, correlated day three of babies less than 28 weeks, which suggested that there is three fold increase in the death and severe morbidity. There is almost four fold increase in the IVH. And there is 
three and a half times increase in the BPD and incidence of neck. Okay, and then the percentage of PDA is associated with almost eightfold rise in the mortality. Okay, so we cannot say PDA, you cannot just ignore PDA. Okay, so it is a, it definitely a lot of evidence showing that it does cause problems. So we need to address it. However, the evidence is changing. As I was saying, the pendulum is swung in the different direction. When I was doing my residency, we used to say, oh, PDA is there, start treatment, start endomethacin, you know, and uh, if PDA is not close by a few weeks time, we used to talk about surgical ligation, you know, very aggressive, as if that, you know, the PDA, uh, PDA is the main problem for everything in this baby. And that was the approach. However, people have definitely moved in 20 years. And uh, this big, big uh, uh, database study from NICHT from the US, which is constituting 61,000 preterm less than 30 weeks gestation in 280 NICs in the US, what it has observed over the last decade or so that PDA diagnosis is decreasing. The way maybe that people are doing less echoes, but however, you know, they're saying that detection rate is less and the closure rate is more. And that's the more evidence uh, is coming. The use of endomethacin ibuprofen has gone down significantly. And PDA ligation, as we all have seen, that have significantly gone down. 2.9%, I would say probably less than 1% also in many units now. We hardly like it babies these days. And, and uh, even with this has changed, the mortality has, has decreased. So definitely by not treating and manage, addressing the duct, there's no much change in the mortality and morbidity. So people started wondering whether, you know, Observation can be the way forward. So then EPIC study uh, of 7,000 newborns across 19 regions in 11 European countries, they also suggested that PDA, treatment of the PDA is a high risk of the BPD. Now it is the way how you interpret this uh, study uh, because babies who have persistent PDA are often sick and they can have high risk of BPD and death. So it is an intellect and it is an observation. So we have to keep this in the background as well. You know, nothing is safe. You want just conservative approach. Yes, possible. Uh, and uh, uh, treating itself is risky. Not treating is also risky. And that's where again the confusion starts. Okay. So now before it gets monotonous, I want all the students also and the residents or fellows to also interact. So I'll put up a, uh, just questions and scenarios where you can type your uh, choice whether you will treat or not treat these doctors. Okay, so chat box is on, right, Mohit Bhai? So, yes, it's, it's on. Chat perfect. box is on. So, and uh, we don't have a poll or anything. So, what I'll suggest is everyone just write their opinion in the chat box. So, first scenario day one of life, 26 plus 3 weeker, 830 grams, is ventilated but stable in 35% and low diastolic blood pressure, but stable gases. And following, the, following is the echo, okay? So this is the ductus, uh, red flow. We'll talk about, you know, it's left to right shunting, and this is the flow pattern. Would you treat this duct or no? You can write your answer, whatever, yes, no, or we'll watch whatever in the chat box, please. No, sir, we won't treat. Okay. Parth is saying no, we won't treat. But this looks like a very big duct, right? Anyone else? No, sir. Okay, so it looks like everyone's saying no, sir, no, sir. And I'm sure I'm dealing with uh, Mohit, Mohit Bhai's uh, fellows, so they, are, they all must be master in PDA. Yes, sir. Okay, Rutu, sir, Rutul Patel thinks uh, we should treat. Yeah, why not? It's a, such a big duct. Anyone else? So Parth, can you comment why you don't want to treat? Just unmute yourself and just say why you don't, would not like to treat. While I'm waiting for others to answer, people can still answer. There is no right and wrong answer.
Parth, would you like to comment? Uh, sir, child is uh, uh, maintaining oxygen uh, on FiO2 of 35 and stable gases are there. So, sir, as okay. you said that uh, treating it is also very uh, risky, like it is having chances of BPD and uh, so that's why I thought. Okay, okay, sure. Okay, so I haven't finished my talk yet, you know, so we are in the still middle of the, but yes, you're right. So we still don't know treating is the right decision or not. And uh, as you rightly said, baby is clinically stable. It's very important, you know, how, what is the clinical status of the baby? And you appreciated probably baby at this size was only on 35%. So you're probably not too much clinically worried. What, anyone else has any other explanation? Uh, Rutul said, yes. Rutul, uh, would you like to talk about this? Rutul, unmute Kar. Uh, just unmute yourself and just comment. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I would like to uh, treat with baby because uh, uh, it's a bi-directional, almost same flow. And also the low diastolic BP is there. So, I suggest to treat. Okay, you suggest to uh, treat because you think it's a bi-directional. We'll talk about exactly what this flow means. Okay. So you would like to treat. Okay. Uh, anyone has comment on what type of uh, ductal pattern is this? Is, you are, Rutul just said bidirectional. Okay, let's go to the next scenario. We will come back to the question again. So same baby, now day four, day three, day four somewhere, uh, uh, got a little worse and uh, if I have to recommend it to almost up to 100%, then settle down to 65%. There was increasing the pressure settings. Maybe started developing metabolic acidosis and respiratory acidosis. And, uh, and then following was the echo finding. One sec, it's not playing. Okay. So would you like to treat or not treat now? Just say yes or no. Treat or no treat. If this is not an exam and I'm not going to question. <laughs> Please comment. Yes. So Rutul is saying yes sir. Treat. Path is now thinking to treat. Okay, I'll go to the same baby now. Okay, this baby after a day or two. So this baby had bidirectional shunting and then sort of little bit settled down after two, three days, still remain ventilated. And then if I were to came back to 30%, so on day six, day seven, still ventilation continuing and 35% oxygen. And then ductus is looking like this. And this is the pattern of the ductus. Now we will treat or not treat. Come on, come on quickly. Uh, uh, this is just to uh, sort of stimulate thinking and make it more interactive. And again, I was trying to sort of show that there is always different opinions on, from different people. Please write in the chat box quickly. Okay, no sir. Rutul has now changed his mind to no sir. Okay, so he doesn't want to treat. Parth. No sir. Okay, fine. So, uh, so it looks like uh, so your opinions are differing with my opinion, okay? Uh, and we'll have a discussion at the end. So considering the time, I would be treating this duct 
okay because the pattern is pulsatile this is unrestricted ductus and a pulsatile pattern uh, is there so there is no signs of restriction baby is on day 6 day 7 and uh, still remain ventilated we are not able to extubate so this ductus is probably contributing and obviously one answer is that you need more information however just based on the pattern and clinical scenario i would have treated but in the first flu just first two scenarios i probably wouldn't have treated and that is another that is the reason was in, uh, to include the second uh, slide so i really want to emphasize if there is a bidirectional shunt or in the first slide as you saw there is a transitional circulation you shouldn't be touching this duct you, bidirectional shunt should never be treated never 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 even if this one message you take away from here today that that will save lives because bidirectional shunt in the presence of pulmonary hypertension is a savior okay it will help baby it will never kill baby but in fact if you close the duct the baby might go into rv duct dysfunction and might get into the trouble and this is the risk of treating the, the ductus blindly if you don't know if you haven't done an echo you start endomethacin or paracetamol prophylactically and if the ductus closes in presence of a pulmonary hypertension the rv can fail and we have seen certain babies where rv is so failed that it was hardly contacted and baby can die so don't treat a ductus is in the transitional circulation we talk about the pattern and also in, in bidirectional shunting but ductus like this one which has got pulsatile flow we have to have more clinical information and other other relevant parameters on the echo okay so what is the significance of the ductus so the, um, from what we saw from the scenarios a significant duct from one baby may not be significant for, uh, for other just based on the echo criteria because there are clinical criteria as well and um, and we need to understand the not only the hemodynamic significance but also the clinical sig significance um which 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 is takes place the other clinical parameter so that's why we quickly going into the scenario we will need to ask we need to know what's the clinical examination we need to know the echocardiography parameters and sometime additional biomarkers so we can look for so this is next few slides we'll talk about that okay so uh, the effects of hemodynamics uh, the significant ducts are depending on the balance between the magnitude of the ductal shunt and ability of the mature myocardium to adapt so all the premise less than 28 29 weeks the myocardium is really weak so that's why below, beyond 30 weeks ductus is not a problem because myocardium can adapt but in smaller babies and more smaller the babies the myocardium may not adapt and you might have more significant effects of pda and again the size of the pda and ductal shunt will also make the effect more evident and the spectrum of effect are caused by two mainly two things uh, one is pulmonary hypocirculation and secondly systemic hypoperfusion if anyone wants to volunteer the effect of systemic hypoperfusion part ruth anyone wants to talk about effects i think the real uh, it's very difficult when you're on the zoom in the real class i usually encourage everyone to speak but anyway so i'll go through it so first is systemic hypoperfusion so because of the uh, cerebral blood flow there will be uh, and if there is a ductus still there will be cerebral hypoperfusion and reperfusion injury causing ivh then there is a effect on the gut so there could be uh, gut ischemia gut uh, poor perfusion and neck and feed intolerance and low systemic blood pressure or blood flow perfusion uh, causing metabolic acidosis lactic acidosis and second effect is because of the pulmonary flooding so because of the over circulation there will be increased oxygen requirement uh, need of ventilation support on uh, if there's a pulmonary hemorrhage uh, there will be respiratory morbidity and mortality we can lose the baby because of this and with the long standing uh, pda there will be dilatation of the heart ccf you will put them on diuretics the side effect of the diuretics these are the effects and more the duration and the volume of the shunt all these effects will be pronounced so how do you evaluate the pda then okay so few questions we have to ask again clinically the the evaluation is slightly different between less than 3 days and more than 7 3 uh, days because the long term effects comes later in first 3 days the question you have to ask if duct is present or not what is the direction of the shunting and how significant is the shunting and important is to rule out if there is any ductal dependent cardiac defect that is the first thing to rule out and that's where the first echo has to be by a cardiologist or a person trained like mohit bai or somebody who's uh, trained in advanced functional echocardiography who can rule out congenital heart disease these are the important question to ask 
quickly going through the assessment uh, so first is present or yes or no so we say yes then second is whether you want to measure so you to measure in color and 2d okay in the supra sternal views so in the workshops we show exactly how you measure and all but uh, here i'll just show you the principles so you have a color and 2d measurement and measure the shortest diameter okay narrowest diameter because uh, uh, if, you, if you measure here your impression will be you know you will be given and that is often confusion with the cardiologist cause sometimes they don't measure the narrowest diameter and they will say three millimeter and you you end up treating this stuff so always look at yourself try to measure the narrowest diameter in 2d and also in color adjust the color gain and it's very important you know sometimes you can make ductus appear very big by increasing the color gain so adjust it appropriately so that you you measure the narrowest and correct diameter and don't overestimate the ductus sometimes ductus is uh, starts to uh, to constrict or sometimes they're kinked or they have got a curved uh, uh, pattern and they're hard to see but they can still be significant but try to try to look at the full course of the ductus whenever possible in different different angles okay the second question is diameter so what diameter is significant so there are different studies looking at different cutoffs and uh, this landmark paper from uh, martin kluko uh, sort of came up with a uh, conclusion based on this 116 preterm that cutoff of 1.6 uh, is, is probably should be followed where uh, the babies uh, above that size have latest symptomatic ductus so the ductus they may tend to remain open in this baby so anything above 1.6 we need to follow or watch or consider to treat okay now so people said okay then what about the size of the baby and the size of the ductus because a lot of people used to correct a uh, uh, two millimeter duct in a one kilo baby is different than two two millimeters duct in a 0.6 so whether you should correct or not however again martin's paper uh, doesn't say that there is there is no direct correlation i think gestation does has an effect but there is no direct correlation uh, with uh, with the size and all, most of the time these babies are around one kilo so it doesn't make a huge difference actually so you don't need to correct for the weight so actual diameter is what we should be watching for and then the comes the important question is the ductal patterns okay which we saw in the echo so in the transition circulation initially there will be some right to left component and then then if there's a pulmonary persistent pulmonary pressures uh, pphn then you have a bidirectional shunting where you have right to left shunting in the systole and then the uh, early part of the systole and then there will be a left to right shunting so anything above is left to right so this is the baseline and we'll see this again in the patterns and this ductus now can evolve and that's why we these are ductus needs to be watched in the transition circulation or in bidirectional ductus we need to make sure pulmonary pressures are fallen significantly and then these ductus can go down and uh, can go into pathway of closed duct where uh, or closing duct where there is a continuous pattern or they might remain open and they get a pulsatile pattern because there is no restriction so they get like a low velocity and pulsatile pattern so uh, again going through different parameters some of my videos won't work this is a right to left ductus uh, so what is right to left and what is left to right okay so anything flowing from pulmonary side to the to the aortic side is right to left and how it is measured so uh, this is the baseline when you put a doppler so just remember below the line b for below the line is the right to left shunting anything above the line will be the left to right and in this baby you can see everything is below the line so this is completely right to left shunting okay and you will see a blue jet uh, here in the in the uh, in the pda and this duct is always 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 abnormal okay a right to left shunt is always abnormal never touch this ductus either it is telling you supra systemic pulmonary hypertension or it is a ductal dependent circulation so always pathological okay but don't treat this duct uh, just watch for other other causes for it okay uh, okay looks like the video is this is the same video which we saw earlier on this is the bidirectional shunting okay so uh, in the third uh, in the second baby which we saw so this is your uh, one cycle and here this is the baseline below the line is the right to left shunting and the above 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 the line is the left to right shunting and this is the whole uh, cycle of the pda uh, shunting so this this is called as typically bidirectional shunting again this 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 is uh, this duct will be present with uh, present of a pulmonary hypertension so you can look at the tricuspid regurgitant jet you can measure the tr velocity etc and again that's a separate talk for pphn assessment you can measure all the other parameters like pvr index and 
uh, your RV fraction area change and uh, PET, RVT ratio and all those things. And all based on these parameters, you can make an assessment of a pulmonary PPHN. And in that, again, the PDA will be remained bidirectional. You just watch that PDA or follow and don't read. Okay. But yes, uh, uh, based on the PDA is helpful in assessing uh, the pulmonary pressures. So if you measure, so this is again one cycle, one full cycle. And if you measure the right to left component and also left to right component, you know that if the right to left shunting is more than 30%, the pulmonary pressures are suprasystemic. And if the shunting is less than 30%, then the pressures are subsystemic. So based on the PDA, you can assess pulmonary pressures. Now coming to the third pattern, which is a pathological pattern. It's called as pulsatile flow. So when we say unrestrictive pulsatile pattern, that means that there is no signs of ductal narrowing happening. So, so there is a early peak, peak here and it doesn't go too high. So there is a, like a low velocity, but it's a pulsatile pattern. And then there is a sort of a diastolic tail here. You can measure systolic and diastolic velocity, but this is a pattern uh, where uh, ductus tend to remain open. There are no signs of closure. So this is the pattern where if you're seeing clinical scenario warrants, then you should be treating. So pulsatile duct should be treated. And then the last pattern is where uh, uh, the ductus starts narrowing. So the velocity, so it's, so it's like pinching the pipe. You know, if you pinch the water pipe, the velocity will go up. Okay, so the velocity starts rising and then the diastolic tail will be longer. And that's why this, this uh, ductus have high velocity. And there's a peak diastolic velocity also goes up and that's why they tend to become like a continuous duct. You know? So that's, that's where you hear a continuous murmur. So this is a sign of a closing duct. If you're seeing this, don't touch that duct. Just follow up in two, three days or four days. In a week's time, these ductus will be closing. No need to worry about. Okay, so this is again a paper by Sue et al. Where the first time she des described uh, different patterns. Okay, so these are the patterns which we talk about. Uh, in fact, I always say, talk about growing pattern first, which is a pattern of a transition circulation. So baby who is born, there's a little bit of right to left component. It's called as growing pattern. You need to allow this baby to transition completely because sometimes they get sick and then they flip into pulmonary hypertension and then they get into bidirectional shunting. So bidirectional shunting, PPHN. So growing pattern, transitional circulation. Then, then becomes is the closing uh, pulsatile pattern which we talk when the ductus remains open. So it's pulsatile pattern like this. And then the last is the closing pattern where the ductus is continuously uh, sort of uh, you get continuous mover, but but the velocity is high. Okay, so just remember these patterns. Now there are other parameters which can tell you whether the ductus is open or not. So if you measure the main pulmonary artery, uh, left pulmonary artery and main pulmonary artery diameter uh, uh, Doppler, then if there is no ductus, this portion will be clean, very clean. There is no turbulence in the diastole. So this is systole, and this this gap is a diastole. But if in the presence of PDA, you see this lot of turbulence here. Okay, so this is systole and this turbulence is your diastole. So if that is present, it tells you there is a duct, which might be significant. Okay, then you look at the descending aorta flow. So when the ductus is there, uh, uh, it, it, it will shunt because uh, uh, if there's a reversal flow, it might shunt from the aorta to the pulmonary side as well in the diastole. So there is a forward flow in the aorta, but sometimes the PDA is shunting significantly it will shunt blood away from the aorta. So first stage will be that you get a zero flow in the diastole. And in the later stage, you start getting a reversal flow in the aorta. So this tells me that ductus is getting more and more hemodynamically significant. When there is a reversal of the shunting in the aorta. So in descending aorta, you measure. And if you see reversal or zero flow, it is telling me the ductus is very significant. This is again, so this is the pattern you will see. Uh, this is probably normal. There is not, not much... Uh, not much comes. So this is again forward flow. There's nothing much going backwards. Here you can see start going a little bit backward. And again here it is a little bit more reversal of the flow in the uh, outer. So starting to get systemic steel. And then there's more steel, more steel. This is telling, this is definitely a severe systemic steel which will compromise the gut. Maybe we'll have feed intolerance. Maybe we might have neck, all those things. So this ductus should be treated because they're causing significant human effects. You can also measure celiac and SMA flow uh, techniques we can talk about in the, uh, in the echo, but basically you make measure the Doppler, you first look at uh, loss of the diastolic flow. Normally it should be like this with some diastolic flow, 
but here you can see there's a lot of loss of uh, diastolic flow and then in certain cases there is a reversal okay reversal below the line is reversal and normally it should be above the line so reversal in the celiac and SMA flow similarly you can do it in the MCA middle cerebral art, uh, uh, artery as well then the other assessment of HSPDA uh, again not going into too much detail but you need to measure the cardiac outputs so this is where you measure the cardiac output you measure the, for any cardiac output you need to have two things one is velocity how much is the blood flowing and through what channel or what uh, valve the blood is flowing so here for the left ventricle output you measure the aortic diameter which is here and then you measure the doppler velocity so you measure the velocity your number what you get is called as vti so you put the number vti here and multiply by that area pi r square and you uh, you divide that by weight weight and then you get a your stroke volume uh, your cardiac output in mils per kilo per minute normally it's between 150 to 350 in early ductus it may not be very high but as the ductus gets long standing it goes to 130 140 uh, sorry uh, 350 400 500 even 600 okay that's what is, you should be watched and uh, similarly light ventricle output you can measure the pulmonary artery diameter first and then you measure the doppler again similar formula vti times pi r square and you get a right ventricle output and and remember what i was trying to show the physiological concept so your rvo when you look at the rvo and lvo often they don't match in the transition circulation and that's where you need to look at the pda size and shunt you look at the pfo and then interpret this uh, uh, cardiac outputs okay svc that's why uh, that's why nikki vance and martin uh in australian group they were proposing more of measurement of svc flow because svc flow is independent of the uh, shunts and that's why uh, and then it is correlated with your IVH and your cerebral autoregulation as well uh, again not going into much detail about it uh, now after three days what are the characters you need to look for so after three days it will be if the baby remains ventilated for seven days or inability to wean the oxygen it is considered significant or if there are certain uh, signs of a large period such as pulmonary hemorrhage or signs of cardiac failure uh, or if clinically babies having high, white pulses, bounding pulses, all these are showing the clinical signs that okay, you need to do an echo, you need to address this duct, you know. So then, then you go and assess the duct again. Here again, you need to look at the ductal dimension and patterns and everything what we saw. But additionally, we need to look at the signs of overcirculation. So you need to look at the LA AO ratio. You need to look at the cardiac output and also the other signs of ductal steel, etc. We spoke about. So quickly going through LAO ratio, I won't go into the detail how you measure it, but basically you compare your left atrium with a fixed diameter, which is your aorta, because that diameter doesn't change, but your LA will change gradually. So you measure in an M mode, compare your LA diameter with the aorta diameter. Uh, you can also measure it in 2D, but that's cardiologists, they do it this way, but that's not very accurate. We do it in the M mode. And based on this study, uh, uh, it was proposed that more than 1.5 sort of ratio uh, should be considered as significant. Okay, so more, but again, often for practical reasons, anything more than two, we definitely start thinking uh, it's very significant. But anything more than 1.5 in early stages in first week, uh, we can start considering it as significant. And as the volume overload uh, con continue, the LA will enlarge and the LV LV size will start enlarging, and that will tell you that okay, there is a shunting happening and over circulation happening. And again, this is a diagram showing that how it will affect. So if there is a more left to right shunt, the more blood will go to pulmonary and there's more blood coming back to the LA and increased preload to the LV. So that's why LA and LV start getting dilated. And again, that causes pulmonary venous congestion, back pressure changes. And then the, eventually the cardiac output will go above 400, 500. And that is an indication where you can start thinking whether you need to like it this stuff because by this time, it is usually four to six weeks and uh, PD is established and all the hemodynamic defects are established and then you know you talk about whether you like it or not. Comparison with MP is another way so sometimes you see the ductus as large as the main pulmonary artery. This is the duct which will never close and you have to clinically decide whether it's causing problem then you need to like it. This, duct, this kind of ducts will never treat, uh, respond to the medical treatment. So uh, another five ten minutes I have so this is just an echo summary uh, and I'm sure uh, you all are aware of this. This is the uh, 
these are the different parameters uh, which we'll talk about moderate or large uh, large ductus depending on the size velocity flow pattern lao ratio and also signs of systemic hypoperfusion okay now now people tried uh, looking at the biomarkers uh, we also published one paper based on uh, bnp uh, you know the practice uh, uh, moved by uh, do we still restrict the fluids or we liberalized or we keep normal or so we keep in the normal range until unless there is a pulmonary edema or there is a card, uh, like dilated cardiomyopathy or uh, you know cardiac failure or something like that only then we restrict otherwise we don't restrict Okay, so I think that's again one take-home message, and again uh, because Mohit is there, uh, I think the practice in lot of centers, the moment they see doctors, they tend to restrict to hundred or one twenty. That can be detrimental because already there's a systemic still happening, and if there is a less systemic circulation, dropping the fluid might make things worse, or the uh, the steel effect might make worse. And that's why you shouldn't be restricting. You should be keeping uh, normal fluids. You probably don't increase rapidly, but keep normal fluids, but don't overtly restrict. uh okay uh, does furosemide uh, cause any benefits or harm that's another practice people uh, say you know whenever there's a ductus you tend to give diuretics however don't treat ductus with furosemide treat the effects if there are over circulation and if you see the lungs are definitely flooded and congested then you can consider furosemide and if there is established chronic lung happen then you can but don't treat ductus with furosemide okay does caffeine affect pda there were observational studies looking at caffeine but it is an association not an effect there is also association people have seen phototherapy but i think it's again uh, not directly uh, correlating so we don't need to be worry about then when to treat i think this is the important dilemma which we need to answer and uh, i would like to know the practice uh, again in uh, your unit uh, by so uh, this this question keeps coming and this itself is a topic of a discussion for an hour an hour or one hour but uh, you know what should be the timing of uh, screening for pda and uh, so uh, and, and treating it so what is what is followed in normal currently so like you know previously when more people were there to do an echo and why when i was really enthusiastic our actual protocol is uh, any baby is less than 28 week or less than 1 kg need okay. to get echo previously we used to do within first uh, 12 hours one echo right and then we used to follow every 24 hours okay right. if and then follow the duct what 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 normally in our terminology is been you monitoring of the pda so we used to see and when the, it used to become hemodynamically significant okay we used to start the treatment even before it presents clinically right but then uh, the now the practical thing happens is like more and more if babies come and if you are the only person you cannot uh, you know start, do an echo as and when required if baby comes at the odd hours and the person on call doesn't know how to do the echo so then few years back we started seeing a spurt of uh, pulmonary hemorrhage in these babies because right. we didn't get then echo done at the proper timing and by that time uh, it was clinical obvious clinically presented uh, hemodynamically significant duct okay so that was an issue so right. now again like we we tend to get an echo done but what we started is and we are collecting data on this that uh, we did one randomized control trial on paracetamol okay so the closure rate was so what we do it we start with the paracetamol initially okay. and then we follow okay. if the duct is non hspda we stop this paracetamol okay and if it is uh, significant we continue and since then we have seen a lesser pulmonary hemorrhage but our data analysis is not been finished we have pre and post we are trying to get an uh, record of two years pre and two years afterwards right 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 that's great i mean uh, so again you just like to mention here like uh, mohit bhai uh, i have followed in fact trajectory of uh, mohit bhai and he he has been an inspiration to go to canada so uh, i think our concepts are very similar in terms of australian and canadian influence so 
uh, and in a hemodynamic interest group i think early uh, targeted approach is still a kind of an approach followed in many places but as you rightly said uh, it has to be practical and it all depends on the availability of the echo facilities and how many fellows or uh, people are trained who can do it so you need to tailor made your approach uh, uh, to suiting to your uh, unit and uh, so that's why but uh, again this is a good uh, sort of a table by shahab uh, shahab nuri saying that you know which approach has which advantages and disadvantages and then you need to choose what is the right approach so you know earlier on people were doing uh, endometriosis and prophylaxis and uh, yes the closure rate achieved was higher because of that and uh, this was um, uh, uh, this was pre symptomatic or echo uh, echo sorry this was uh, and that was uh, uh, causing less ivh so the main protection was for ivh and less pulmonary hemorrhage and it has reduced the ligation rate also very low but it has caused very very significant unnecessary treatment and side effects of the endometriosis and that's why and the, the evidence was mainly from the tip trial uh and uh, that's why the this approach has now gone down but still many units are still following it so that's uh, where the advantages and disadvantages are now the early symptomatic pre symptomatic or echo based approach is what mohit uh, bhai was talking about and we also follow where because clinical signs often come late you know you don't get bounding pulses or any other things or even murmur for that matter in for 72 hours but you can get a lot of signs on the echo and that's why if you do pre, uh, early echoes and uh, and right, identify right babies maybe sometime on day one you may not treat but you know what the day duct is like on day one and then you follow up on day two or day three and you see how it is changing then you can decide about uh, treating and and that achieves a good closure rate and it mainly the whole idea is to protect ivh and pulmonary hemorrhage which happens in first maximum in first 72 hours and up to seven seven days so you need to address that in that period only so if you want to achieve i reduce reduction in ivh and hemorrhage you need to have this this approach and it has re done re a reduction of the ligation but there is still some unnecessary treatment there will be drugs which might uh, might have closed uh, on its own and you have just unnecessary feeder this drug that's why the non hemodynamic group people object this approach then early symptomatic or hemodynamic symptoms so you know by 5 7 days lot of people wait for the signs clinical signs and then do an echo that also achieves good closure however no protection for ivh okay so that's a big no no and the reduction of ligation is less in these babies but yes it it has a very less uh, unnecessary treatment so so a lot of centers are in between somewhere between these two approaches left symptomatic so there is a group in european some people are uh, following a non a conservative approach you know late late symptomatic they just wait 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 you know and naturally as i Describe earlier, eighty-five percent doctors will still close, but you know you don't get any any advantage or any benefits. Okay, and uh, again same thing. If you don't do anything at all, there is no advantage. Plus, there is increased risk of neck and mortality. So that's why we need to have a middle approach, and this is a principle. I think uh, I think every you know it probably should follow, and you need to have a guideline and a, a targeted approach, and everyone should follow that approach. and uh, that definitely helps this is what we followed in new zealand and in my current unit also dr gupta is uh, our human dynamic lead and uh, we sort of have a fixed approach and protocol i to paracetamol in coming years and many many units like yours have already adapted as paracetamol you give a try with paracetamol it doesn't work then try with ibuprofen but most of the people have uh, moved away from indomethacin as a drug of choice quickly talking about uh, 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 tdi ligation again um, mohit uh, is aware of this criteria uh, uh, which we followed in sick kids and this is a paper uh, we published again uh, talking about how having a dedicated uh, pdi ligation assessment team helps make a difference uh, you know you you basically categorize these babies based on their clinical status and you categorize based on the pda so a lot of babies used to get referred for ligation we used to classify them in these different categories sometimes based on the echo and then we used to defer them and these babies none of these babies few of them came back for ligation but 
many of the ligations were avoided and the complications of the ligations were avoided. And um, so again, the new approach was because there's an increased risk of morbidity and uh, side effects with surgical ligation, people are now coming with transcutheter uh, occlusion and our unit uh, also, there are I think five or six has been done where you uh, go through femoral and then try to uh, put a device. So device closure, in, even in as low, uh, as smaller as 600 or 800 grams has been done in our unit. So that is a new way forward. We can do transcutheter occlusion. There are various devices available in the market and people are going for it but again i don't know whether it is safe we have seen a couple of disastrous complications where we could have lost the limb uh, uh, because femoral artery was fiddled so nothing is safe <laughs> so and uh, the safety increases with uh, more experience and uh, depending on the expertise you know so again uh, it has to be used uh, with a caution so take home so it can be pda can be beneficial or or it could be a bystander so don't always jump and treat duct and uh, in presence of heart disease or pH, don't touch the PDA. And uh, just look for uh, PDAs in extreme preterm population uh, as a normal approach is less than 20. Similarly, we follow less than 29 weeks uh, and in first 72 hours, try to do early targeted treatment. But again, this is our approach. You can defer the way you like. And uh, beyond three days, you have to look for the hemodynamic circulation based on the echo and uh, then choose your medication which is your institutional medication of choice and uh, more than two weeks or more than four, four weeks uh, if they're depending on ventilator you've tried your steroids and everything and still ductus is large there are a lot of hemodynamic effect then you can con consider for ligation but again with caution with that i will stop and i can happy to take any questions it's four o'clock actually sorry for a long talk <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Kiran. It was really very nice, very nice talk. It has covered most of the things and very informative uh, for our residents and our fellows. So if anybody has got any question, they can unmute and ask or um, either they can put in the chat box.